Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. I am here uh, after our second day of the MDS conference here in Vancouver. I've got my little fuzzy friend behind me there again. Um, I am so excited to tell you guys everything that I have learned today, or at least the key takeaway points. We learned some really, really, really cool and interesting things today, so I'm very excited to tell you about those. We're going to be talking a little bit today about autonomic dysfunction, so that's things like uh, lots of sweating issues or urinary issues, um, orthostatic hypertension or getting dizzy when you stand up or feeling like you're going to faint. We're going to talk about some things to do with sleep and depression and we're also going to talk about neuroplasticity so lots of fun and interesting things today it's so great to be in the conference and with so many people who are excited and interested in the future and uh, what's going on in Parkinson's so let's get started so first we're going to talk a little bit about neuroplasticity um, we had a lecture today on motor dysfunction by a man named John Rothwell and it was a very cool and interesting lecture and he talked to us about a study and one of the key points of the study was that they stopped DBS. So what they did is they took patients who had DBS implants and they actually stopped the input. So they um, took away the DBS input and what they found was that people actually maintained their motor function, lots of them, and some of them actually even got a little bit better. And this lasted for up to two weeks after turning off the DBS. And what their theory was is that what had happened with the DBS is you had created neuroplastic change in the brain. And so the areas around where the DBS was put in uh, actually managed to change and improve so that when the DBS was turned off, those motor patterns still allowed for some really, really good functional movement and patterns and function in general. So that is a really, really true, amazing example of neuroplasticity. And it shows that we can really change the brain by creating better movement patterns and by creating optimal movement. We can optimize other areas in the brain and, and really change the way we function. So neuroplasticity is talked about a lot when we talk about exercise and this is a really great example of uh, how neuroplasticity can maintain and improve movement. So that was a very, very cool study. Um, it also just highlights a little bit the importance of physiotherapy if you've had DBS. So maintaining those movement patterns and improving those movement patterns, DBS gives you a really, really great opportunity to do that. So if you were having a lot of trouble or struggling with movement before your DBS, once you've had it, you have kind of this really optimized window to be able to manage those movement patterns and improve them. So really making sure that if you are getting DBS or you've had it, that you've been seeing a physiotherapist and are following up to train those movement patterns and create neuroplasticity in the other areas of brain. So that was a very cool study that he talked about. Um, another piece of a lecture we had today was on functional capacity and they also talked about neuroplasticity a little bit. So what they did in some of the studies that they talked about were they worked on handwriting. So they did some studies where they did t finger tapping and handwriting. Um, they showed that even after 30 minutes of finger tapping exercises in people with Parkinson's, they already had changes in brain activity. So they were measuring brain activity and they showed re reduction in certain activity in certain regions and increase in activity in others. So they were already showing neuroplastic change after only 30 minutes of finger tapping training. It was an amazing study that showed the capacity for learning and neuroplastic change in the brain. Then another study that they did that I was talking about that focused on handwriting was they did this six week handwriting training and they showed different areas of the brain that started to be involved in this handwriting that weren't involved at the beginning as people started to learn and retrain those motor patterns. So again, it just shows us the capacity of the brain to change through practice and repetition and variety and exercise, whether it be handwriting exercises or finger tapping exercises or high amplitude exercises that we do in, in our training. So it was a, a really, really cool way to start the day and just emphasize the importance of neuroplastic change in the brain and how common and possible it is. So the next thing that they talked about in that lecture was kind of areas surrounding exercise. And I get lots of questions all the time about what type of exercise I should be doing, you know, um, which is better, should I be doing dance, should I be doing Tai Chi, should I be doing aerobic training? And they talked, spoke a little bit about what's really important in those training paradigms and they had some really informa interesting information to talk about. So um, one of the things they showed, we, we did review some of the basics. We know that Tai Chi is very good for balance. We know that dance is very good for balance. We know that treadmill training is a very important component of training, aerobic training. But they started to talk about some really new and interesting studies that were being done on areas that were just a tiny bit different. So 
One of the studies that they talked about was a study on high challenge balance training. So these are really, really challenging and dynamic balance exercises as compared to kind of the more static standing exercises that you may have seen in the past. And this is a really cool field of study and a really interesting result. They found that these high challenge balance exercises didn't increase falls risk while the people were training and it showed really great effects on gait and patterning and, and motor function in general. So, you know, this is a really key thing to think about when you're doing your training, however you're doing it, that you are really getting challenged, right? That you are not doing exercises that are super easy for you, but that you're actually really getting challenged in your capacity and challenging your brain to change. So that was one really neat study that they talked about. Another one that they talked about was progressive resistance training and that that's a really key and important component that they're doing a lot more studies on now and that have had really positive results. So making sure that you're working with someone to include some progressive resistance training in your program that can be, you know, with bands or a TRX machine or body weight, but just including that resistance training in your program somehow, or talking to your therapist or your trainer about adding that in. Another thing that they talked about, which was very interesting was virtual reality treadmill training. So they showed a study where they had done basic treadmill training versus, versus virtual reality treadmill training. And I know not all of us have, or most of us don't have virtual reality capacities to be able to do this, but it is kind of the future. So what they showed is that in virtual reality, you can really practice adding cognition into your walking. So stepping over things or having obstacles come in front of you and having to step over them in virtual reality. So though we may not all have that capacity to do that, you know, in our gym, it does tell us that, that adding in that cognitive component and that kind of unexpected um, piece of it can really help in creating neuroplastic change in the brain. So that is the future of, uh, possibly the future of physiotherapy and exercise and Parkinson's is virtual reality coming your way. So that was a really interesting uh, kind of topic to talk about. They finished that talk with kind of some key components and this is where, where you know, when we're talking about what needs to be involved in an exercise program, there's a lot of things that need to be involved in an exercise program and you can talk to your physiotherapist about that. But a few of the key ones that they talked about today, which were very interesting, were incorporating motor and cognitive integration into your program. So that means not just doing the motor task, but actually adding cognitive challenges in it. So uh, Nate Co uh, Coomer and I are gonna do a video tomorrow morning on a few kind of cognitive exercises that you can do to practice that. So tune in tomorrow morning for a Facebook Live that we're gonna do on that. Um, but making sure that you have some cognitive component to your training and uh, that can be things like, you know, naming colors as you step or being challenged to count backwards from 100 by 3 is always one of my favorite ones. Doing things where you have to choose from categories or name things on the fly. Those are really good ways to in integrate kind of cognitive challenges into your into your program. And the other important component is dual tasking. So practicing those dual tasks, you know, we talked a little bit about this in the last video, but um, in the way of cueing, but things like practicing walking and talking, practicing, you know, walking and turning your head, practicing, you know, moving your hands and your feet at the same time, doing those dual tasks so that your brain is really challenged to change. And it, and it did show really good results in the research. Uh, the other thing that they talked about was sufficient intensity. And we do talk about this a lot in Parkinson's training. So one of the ways that they showed this, there's this very interesting study that came out a while ago that, that showed a big review saying that physiotherapy doesn't help with Parkinson's and, and there was kind of this big uproar. And when you look closer at the study, what you see is that they actually did very, very little therapy. So they actually did um, four sessions uh, of therapy. Two of them were assessments and then it was one session with an OT and one session with a PT. So very, very little therapy in total. And that speaks a lot to the importance of intensity, right? Making sure that you're actually getting a sufficient amount of training. So I said this in the last video as well, right? Doing something once for a long period of time is not nearly as effective as doing it consistently over time, day after day after day. So, you know, if you're seeing a physiotherapist, then you're going to the gym, going for walks, doing different training activities um, in different ways, but making sure that you're getting that intensity in as much as possible and that frequency. So, you know, whatever kind of training you are doing, make sure that you have that frequency and intensity built in. Once a week is not nearly enough to get the changes that we want to see, right? We always tell people five to seven days a week of that activity is really important. The other thing that they talked about was cueing and feedback. And we talked about a, a little bit about this yesterday, just talking about how important it is at the beginning of training and the importance of actually taking that cueing away slowly. I'm not gonna go into detail because we did talk about that yesterday. Um, and the last thing I talked about, which is important as a therapist and a client, is that we need to train with an individualized approach. So each person is gonna need a little bit of a different program. 
Um, you need to do what works for you, right? Some people really like group classes. Some people like group sports. Some people like individual time. Some people, you know, like to be on the treadmill. Some people like to be on the bike. If it's not salient to you and it's not something that you like to do, then you're not going to keep it up. So whatever type of exercise you're doing, make sure that it is something that you love and something that you enjoy. So moving on from there, we are going to talk a little bit. We had an lecture on cognitive and behavioral training in PD. And this was a very, very interesting lecture. I'm going to tell you about the key point that we took out of this or that I took out of this. So one of the things he talked about in this lecture is the dopamine reward system. So he gave an example of a study that they did with these mice. And what they did is they put them in a little setup where they were behind a wall and they were taught that when they went to the other side of the wall, they were going to get a reward. And the reward was food pellets for them. And then they measured the dopamine output. And what they found is that, you know, we think that dopamine, we thought that dopamine used to come out when you, when you get something you really like, you know, you eat something delicious or you do something great and you get this kind of outflow of dopamine. And what they found is actually the dopamine was released beforehand. It was released in anticipation of this reward. So you actually can get that dopamine output just by anticipating a positive reward in your environment. And that is really important when you put it into practice for things like goal setting, right? Making sure that you have clear, set, and concise goals so you can anticipate success and you can get that dopamine release before even getting to the finish line, right? It is throughout that journey that you can get those dopamine releases, which is really important. Um, they found the same thing in a maze, right? When the dopamine started to ramp up in the brain as these, these uh, animals approach the end of the maze. So again, it just shows you that the anticipation of that reward is really significant in creating that dopamine release. So the power of goal setting and the power of positive thinking, right? N knowing that you have something you're trying to achieve and believing that you're going to have, that you're going to achieve it can already begin to cause that dopamine release. Um, the other thing that he said is that dopamine was released when animals were moving purposefully in their environment. So again, that speaks to making sure that we are doing exercise and implementing it into a functional environment. So not just doing exercise, you know, doing the exercises that you do in the gym or other places, but actually using it in, in the functional world, practicing your stepping patterns when you're when you're outside in the park or when you're in the grocery store practicing those tips and tricks and movement patterns to actually bring them into a purposeful environment and just that alone can help with dopamine release. So that's a very, very cool thing to think about is that you, you know, just the anticipation of success, you know, and planning ahead a little bit can really help release that dopamine. So we want purposeful and goal driven environments to help release that dopamine is kind of the final message there. So we're going to move on to the last few topics that we're going to talk about today, which are um, autonomic dysfunction, depression, and sleep. So the only thing I'm going to say about depression that we talked about today and that I think is very, very important and that which the lecturer stressed, which I thought was a great thing, is that depression and anxiety are non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. It's not just a depression because, you know, you, you got a diagnosis and it's challenging and you're trying to deal with it. They are non-motor symptoms as par uh, of Parkinson's and they are as real as the rigidity or the tremors. So, you know, you are not alone and, and they should be taken seriously. And we'll talk a little bit about what treating depression can do for sleep as well. But if you have those symptoms, you know, don't brush them off. Don't, you know, just and pretend that they're going to get better, make sure you're getting them treated and make sure you're taking them seriously. You are not alone and they are very, very, very common non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So one thing I'm going to talk about now is autonomic dysfunction. This is a very um, interesting area for me. I think it's very relevant to lots of my clients. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. So autonomic dysfunction is abnormal functioning of the autonomic nervous system. And the autonom autonomic nervous system is essentially in control of things that you do without consciously thinking of them. So your breathing system, your digestive system, you know, your heart rate, your blood pressure, things like that. So autonomic dysfunction can present in a whole bunch of different ways. A few of them are things like heat sensitivity, um, hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating, salivation. So they were talking about how autonomic dysfunction can, can present as uh, excess salivation, which can affect speech and swallowing and things like that. It can present in uh, the urinary track so you can get frequency you can get incontinence you can have to get up multiple times in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom that's a very common way it presents um, it can pre present in the reproductive system so as things like erectile dysfunction trouble ejaculating things like that and it can also present as orthostatic hypotension and that is a very very big one when it comes to parkinson's because if you have orthostatic hypotension it can put you at risk of falls so that's one we're going to focus on today so 
Orthostatic hypertension is what happens when you stand up and your blood pressure drops. So in a normal person without autonomic dysfunction, they stand up and when they do the testing, their blood pressure is the same lying down as it is standing or it's very similar, it doesn't move very much. In somebody who has autonomic dysfunction or orthostatic hypertension, what happens is you're lying down and your blood pressure is a certain level, you stand up and your blood pressure drops significantly. And that can be very dangerous. It can lead to falls, you can feel dizzy, you can get pain in the back of your head. Um, it's a very significant symptom. What they also found in the research, and this is kind of new research that has come out, is that when you lie back down, your blood pressure can actually go up significantly. So you can have a combination of low blood pressure when you stand up and high blood pressure when you lie down. So it's very common. They placed it somewhere between uh, the, the high number was around 59% of people with Parkinson's. And what the lecturer was saying, which is very true, is that lots of people aren't diagnosed with it. So very often it's not caught. So it actually could be a much higher number than that. So again, the symptoms of orthostatic hypertension, if you're not sure if you have it, is dizziness or um, feeling of faintness on standing. You can get pain in the back of your head. You can get, um, you can actually get, um, feelings of weakness in your legs or wobbliness in your legs, which is a very common one that I hear, um, and you can be having falls. So um, orthostatic hypertension is something that can be managed in a few different ways. It's really, really important to be tested by your doctor, even if you don't think you have it, because some people are asymptomatic. And the key important point with that is that even if you are asymptomatic, because the dopaminergic medications that they give you for Parkinson's can have an effect on blood pressure, as you titrate those medications up, as you start to take more of those medications, you can actually have a significant effect on blood pressure. So if you already have orthostatic hypotension and you may not be symptomatic, as you start to increase those meds, it can cause significant symptoms and put you at risk of things like falls. So it's very important to know ahead of time if you have it and to be tested by your doctor. It's a very easy test. They test your blood pressure in lying down, wait a few minutes and test your blood pressure in standing. So there's a few different ways to manage this and what I loved about this speaker is that he spoke first about the non-pharmacological management so you know things that we can do without jumping to medications first um, and a few of the things that he said and this this is a big one that I tell all my clients is pause when you stand up so when you're going from sitting to standing take a moment and pause breathe count to three and give your blood pressure a little bit of time to adapt or at least give you give yourself the time to to stop and be safe so that if you feel dizzy or you feel like you might fall you have time to react if you stand up and start moving right away you're already three steps in when you start to feel dizzy and that's very often when people fall the other thing you can do to manage this is to do things like toe and heel pumps before you stand up. So lifting your heels up and down off the ground can help engage the muscles and help get your blood pumping through your system and moving faster before you stand up, which can help a little bit with the regulation of that blood pressure when you stand. Another thing that you can do is make sure you're hydrated. So if you are dehydrated, the orthostatic hypertension can be really, really exacerbated. So making sure that you're getting enough fluid intake and enough salt intake. And one of the very interesting facts that he gave is that when they, they did a study and they showed that people um, who drank, if they gave people two glasses of water, so two full glasses of water, in some of the population, they were actually able to increase their blood pressure, even for those whose blood pressure weren't increased by going on medication. So drinking those two glasses of water in some cases was more effective than going on medication. So it just shows you how important hydration is. So really make sure that you are hydrated and that you have enough salt intake as well to help that water get absorbed. Um, so those are the non kind of pharmacological measures, right? Safety in the environment, making sure you're not getting up fast. Oh, the other one is compression stockings can help a lot. So stockings that help that avoid the blood pooling into your feet can help as well. It's a really great method. Um, pharmacologically, there are different ways to help. There's a bunch of different medications. He mentioned, um, droxidopa, which is, has proved effective, and that's reduced the total number of falls in people with PD, especially those obviously who are falling because of orthostatic hypotension, so that's one medication they manage. But again, if you've tried non-pharmacological management and you're having trouble, please make sure you talk to your doctor. Um, the other thing is that, again, because some of these people are having higher blood pressure when they were lying down, you may find that adding something under your pillow to create a little bit of a tilt and keep you at a little bit of a down angle when you're sleeping is helpful as well if you do have orthostatic hypotension. Um, if you have orthostatic hypotension and you have high blood pressure in other environments, you want to be careful because if you go on medications to lower your blood pressure, especially at night, and then you get up to, for example, go to the bathroom, you can be at a really high risk of falls. So just be aware of that. So 
that's my bout about autonomic dysfunction. It is very, very prevalent in Parkinson's disease and it's really important to talk to your doctor about because there are treatment methods, you know, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological that they can do to help you manage those different symptoms. Um, the next thing uh, that we're gonna talk about and the last thing we're gonna talk about today is sleep. So I know this is a complaint from or a challenge with lots of my clients and we know through the research that um, disturbed sleep and REM sleep disorders are some of the, often the first, first, first symptom of Parkinson's before you know any of the other stuff comes on. Um, and the stat they gave is that as many as 80 to 90 percent of Parkinson's clients prevent, present with some sleep disturbance issues. So one of the things he talked about was insomnia, so not being able to fall asleep. And he talked about a few different ways to manage that, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So. Um, for those of you who may be on medications like um, selegiline or amantadine, he was talking about how those can actually uh, cause problems uh, if you have insomnia at night. So making sure that you're not taking those medications later in the day can be a significant improver for uh, insomnia. Making sure that you're minimizing fluid intake before bed so that you're not drinking a lot right before bed and having to get up to pee very frequently. Some people will take diuretics during the day. Again, you wanna be careful because you do need to stay hydrated. It's very, very important with Parkinson's for things like autonomous dysfunction, but also to avoid constipation and things like that. Um, but if you're really having trouble at night with getting up to urinate or not being able to sleep because of that, taking diuretic a little bit earlier in the day can sometimes help. One option for people who are really struggling is a bedside commode. So this is something that people may not think about, but that can be a great option. Uh, you can get a bedside commode, or for men, you can get a little urinal that you put beside the bed so that you don't actually have to get up and go to the bathroom each time you have to go, especially if it's in the middle of the night. Um, you just go into the commode or the urinal. It allows you to get back to sleep quicker and more easily and reduces the risk of falls. The other thing that he mentioned that was very, very interesting was depression. So one of the things he said is that depression can often cause um, early waking cycles and sleep disruption. So what he was saying is that if you have depression or you think you have depression and you're also having sleep issues, that actually managing the depression with antidepressants or other measures has actually been shown to improve sleep and wake cycles. So it may be that that's actually the contributing factor that's causing sleep issues. And if you treat one, that it will improve the other. And the other thing is to make sure that you don't have any other coexisting sleep disorders. So some really disturbing REM sleep disorders where you're hitting or flailing in your sleep. And if you do, to make sure you're getting those addressed because those obviously can contribute to insomnia as well. Um, when he was talking about REM sleep disorders, uh, the, the type of disorders where you tend to jump out of bed or do things that are dangerous, hitting people, um, enacting dream, reenacting dreams, things like that. Uh, he was just saying that clonazepam and melatonin are kind of the new favorable drugs that they're finding have a positive effect on that. Um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about is daytime sleepiness. I know this is a big issue for lots of clients with Parkinson's. One of the things that he said is that sometimes and often actually losing sleep at night is not the cause of daytime sleepiness, that they can be different mechanisms. And this was very interesting to hear. So if you're having daytime sleepiness, obviously you want to make sure that you're optimizing your bedtime routine so you can get as much sleep at night as possible, but it may be also that it's coming from a different mechanism. And one of the up and coming therapies that he said is proving to work really well is bright light therapy. And so this is a new novel treatment that you may want to think about and talk to your doctor about if you're having a lot of daytime sleepiness. Um, there was a question from the audience regarding dopamine and dopamine agonists for sleep. I know in my clientele that some people find dopamine, um, like their L-DOPA, if they change the, the doses a little bit or they go into controlled release, that that significantly helps with sleep. Um, he said that it is very individual for clients and some people find that um, dopamine agonists can make it work or worse or better and same with L-DOPA. So it is very individual was his answer and uh, in my clientele that's what I found as well. But it's just worth thinking about if you are having sleeping troubles that sometimes adjusting those medications can significantly help with sleep. So I know that's a lot of information. Uh, we learned a lot of cool and interesting stuff today. So hopefully that gives you some new information. We know that with, you know, with Parkinson's and any other condition, you need to be your own advocate. So the more educated you are on these things and the more you can talk to your doctor um, with knowledge about these things, the better help you're gonna get. So I hope that gives you some information you can use. Um, like I said, we're gonna be doing an exercise video tomorrow, focusing on goal-directed movement and some cognitive challenges with movement. So tune in tomorrow morning to see that. And I will see you guys tomorrow for that, as well as another update on things I have learned at the Congress. Thanks so much. Have a good night, guys.